the phrase God uses for, for David as a man after God's own heart. What did that look like? What does it look like to serve God even when you're in the midst of a great rivalry? This morning we'll see that from 1 Samuel 18. Let me invite you to stand as we sing, come praise him and worship him. this day when we can gather together, the fellowship we have just with one another, the presence of your spirit among us. We thank you for your word that can guide our steps, give us the encouragement we need as we see how you've worked in the lives of those who've gone before. We thank you for the teachings you give us, the principles you sometimes give us direct commands that can guide our steps into the paths of righteousness. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give praise to you, to hear from your word, and to be encouraged by one another's presence. We pray your blessing on this hour in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A couple of uh, announcements and other notes I want to make. Men on a Mission is meeting today right after the morning service down in the library. Men on a Mission. Um, I have a note here from Kelly Swimley. Thank you for all of your prayers, support, and generosity for Starters Day Camp. They had three weeks of day camp this year. God gave us a fantastic year. Many first-time campers from the community. We had the opportunity and blessing to see spiritual fruit in the lives of these kids and those who returned for junior camp. That's what's exciting. Kids who've been in the starter day camp maybe for a year or two then return for junior camp. Junior campers eventually return to teen camp, and teen campers eventually become staff. And staff eventually become directors of ministries and and parents and bring their kids to camp. It's an amazing thing. I was speaking to one of our board members um, the other day. I met down in Ithaca. And he's also connected with another Christian camp in the area. And that camp is a great camp, has great facilities, had a great history, but has just really been struggling to bring kids in and struggling to bring families in. And God has blessed. Lamoka passed their highest all-time total this week when when the teen campers come in. They'll hit over 568 campers for the summer. They also have their highest total in uh, in, uh, family camps for the two weeks. And retreats are all scheduled for the fall. And they just received a gift of $25,000 from a family to go toward additional projects at the camp. The camp is doing amazing. Pray for the volunteers and the staff who are going to serve both this week and the next week and through the fall. Uh, This is the time when people get a bit tired and uh, things get uh, a little bit weary. But uh, pray for them. Some exciting things. I have another note here. We are participating again this year in the Fireman's Parade. We are going to be handing out water bottles. That is on Saturday, August 26th, I think is the right date. Saturday, August 26th. We are also going to be handing out candy for Awana. If you want to be part of that, handing out candy, meet here at the church at 3 o'clock. That's when we'll meet both for the water bottles and for the candy, and that is on Saturday the 26th. So that is coming up. It's in the bulletin, uh, the fireman's parade and the water bottle. I'll put in the bulletin about the candy giveaway as well. Um, Our call to worship this morning comes out of Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. This connects David, who will eventually be king of Israel, to the final king, Jesus Christ, who will reign over all the earth. Let's stand together and sing about our faith in Jesus Christ and what that means for us. We 
1 Samuel 18, verses 6 through 12. Follow along as I read. 
Now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Then Saul was very angry. And the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed only thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the house. So David played music with his hand, as at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped his presence twice. Now Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. In this morning's lesson in the life of Peter, Jesus tells him, I am praying for you that your faith will not fail and that when you return to me, because he will deny him three times, you will have the power to strengthen the other disciples. The song we're going to sing just before the message speaks about our life is found in Jesus Christ and the strength comes from him. seated we'll invite the kids up here as we play a little rivalry game tonight to play this game it's going to be based on height it's going to be based on height. You think we can play a game based on height? Yeah. You think you can reach this bell? Yeah. Not you guys. Let's see, Malachi, come on up here. Can you reach that bell to bang it? Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent. We're going to play a little game called Rivals. You know what a rival is? No. Rival is a competitor, person you're trying to beat. I would say probably Trent and Travis are rivals. Are you? Oh, yeah. yeah, you're probably rivals. Um, between you guys here, who are the most rivals? Who wants to beat the other? You, you want to beat, those two want to beat each other? You want to beat both of them? You want to beat, all right. All right, so you can choose a rival to come up here. Uh, who has a rival they already want to play against? Who do you want to play against? You want to play against your brother. You want to do that? You want to play against your sister? All right, come on up here. All right, so here's how it's played. Hands have to be at your side. Don't be so close that you bang your face into this. First one who knows the answer rings the bell. And then, we, and then we, we're playing for pennies. Playing for pennies, okay? First answer rings the bell. This is, these are questions from the Bible. Should I give you a hard question or an easy question? All right, we'll give you a hard question. All right. Uh, we could just go in order, but no, that's too, that's too easy. All right, here's the question. First one to ring the bell. He owned a staff that could become a snake. David. No. David's staff did not become a snake. <laughs> Moses is correct. Thank you. You guys can sit. Oh, here. You have a penny for playing. Here. Have a penny for playing. There you go. 
I still have gumballs. I haven't changed the candy yet. Um, do you have a rival? Who? Who's your rival? Who you want to play against? Robert. Come on up here. All right, Robert and Jared. They're, they're about the same height. Okay. All right. Um, here's the question. Who built the ark? Yeah, your hand was below his hand. That was good. Wow. It was like, all right. So if you're the first one to hit the bell, hold your hand there and don't pull it out because I almost missed in the instant replay, you know, who got that? Who did you say? Noah's Noah correct. Noah's correct here. Yeah, I know you were going to say that. That was pretty easy. All right. We're going to go. Okay. Who do you want to play against? Dean. Dean. Okay. Brother and sister. You got to love this brother and sister thing here. All right. Here's the question. Hmm. Which son of Jacob became a slave? Which son of Jacob became a slave? His brother sold him into Egypt, into slavery. What was his name, the one who went to Egypt? Do you know that one? You probably know. Joseph. Joseph is correct. There you go. There you go. All right, excellent. All right, who hasn't been up here? All right, who do you want? Lincoln. What two animals did David kill as a shepherd? Lion and a bear. Hold on, hold on. You don't have to, you, nobody leaves empty-handed. Got to get rid of the pennies. I need them back in my gumball machine. That's where I took them from. All right, who hasn't played yet? Annika, who do you want to play against? What? You don't care. You don't care. Malachi? All right, Malachi, come on up here, playing against Annika. <laughs> Stand there, face here. All right, Malachi. All right, here's the question. Are you going to pay attention, Malachi? Who created the world? Jesus, God, very good. Did you, were you already up here? Okay. Couldn't remember. All right, uh, who hasn't been up here? Has everybody been up here? What, just Trent and Travis? All right, come on up. I saved the best for last. This is a Schweitzer question. You'll understand in just a moment. Hands at your side. How tall was Goliath? Yes, you got the nine inches too. Nine foot nine. All right. Did I use everybody? I think we used everybody. Here were some of the other questions I had. Yeah, it's it. You get. You want a penny? Do you want a penny? You're welcome. I was going to ask this question. Um, how many sons did Jacob have? Twelve. Uh, what sea did God part for Israel to cross? The Red Sea. Who was the first king of Israel? Saul. Who did uh, Samuel anoint as the second king of Israel? David, here's the question for today. So Saul is king of Israel, but God anoints David king of Israel. Does that cause a problem if there's two kings? Is that going to cause a little bit of an issue? David goes out and fights Goliath when Saul is too scared to fight Goliath. Is that going to cause a problem? When they come back from the battle and the people cry out, David's killed his ten thousands and Saul has killed his thousands, is that going to be a problem? Yeah, there's going to be a rivalry here. The question is, if you're in a rivalry as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, how should you behave if you're in a rivalry? Does God want you to compete to be better? Or does God have something else in mind? That's what we're going to talk about in the service this morning. If you're going to go to junior church, you can leave right now. If you want an outline, they're up here. Thank you very much. And now the service has officially begun. You realize uh, you're Trent, right? You're Travis. Whatever. You realize you're spending like four days with me this week. Payback. I'll just say payback. I have a lot of work to be done around my house. And you're just tall enough to do it. Does God encourage rivalries? I wrote down this morning just some of the, the big rivalries that came to mind. Do you guys remember Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan? 
the ice skaters. Do you ever think that ice skating would become a contact sport? You've probably heard of Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali. Back when Muhammad Ali at one time was Cassius Clay, then became Muhammad Ali, great rivalry. How about uh, Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa? Do you remember that year when they were hitting home runs left and right and trying to see? The latest one is, I don't know that they're going to do it. I heard it was going to be a cage match. Zuckerberg and Musk. You want to see a couple of billionaires fight it out? I mean, not on the corporate scale, not in Wall Street, but actually in a cage. I mean, that would be worth paying a few dollars to see, to see a couple of billionaires beat each other up. Does God want us to compete with one another? Is that a philosophy? Is that a principle as found in the scriptures? Is the, does God want us to strive for success or be all we can be? That was the Marines, right? Be all you can be or climb every mountain. I think that was a song, um, climb every mountain. Does God want us? There was a woman who just broke the record for climbing 14 8,000 meter mountains, the Eight, the 14 tallest mountains in the world, she climbed them in 90 days. 90 days she climbed all of them with a Sherpa guide and just set the new world record for women. Apparently men have done it even faster than that. Is that what God wants for us? Is the pursuit of the American dream more Darwin or Jesus? The pursuit of the American dream. The pursuit of the American dream, according to Darwin, is this, Right? We live to the truth, survival of the fittest. The American dream is, if you want the most, you got to work the hardest. If you want to succeed, you got to be the one willing to pay the price. That would be evolutionary Darwin thinking. What does Jesus say? Mark chapter 9, verse 35. I thought I'd start with a scripture. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. See, is the American dream actually in any way reflective of what Jesus taught in the scriptures. Is servanthood success? Could we define servanthood as success? If we succeed as a servant, what do we expect? Do we not expect to ascend to the level of master? If you're a good enough servant, you eventually become a master. We look at the life of Joseph. That's why I threw Joseph into that little quiz. Joseph starts out as a slave. He becomes a servant. He becomes a master. He becomes second in charge of all of Egypt. I mean, so that's the American, that's the Hebrew, that's the biblical dream, right? That's the Christian dream. As you succeed as a servant, you get greater responsibility, greater opportunity, you become the master. What can we learn from Saul and David? Here's two characters for which the Bible devotes a lot of chapters. We're talking most of 1 Samuel is devoted to the rivalry between Saul and David, and then you move into 2 Samuel and deal much more with David himself. When the defeat of the Philistines was complete, King Saul inquired as to the family and the lineage of this teen warrior who defeated the champion Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 55, he says this, Abner, whose son is this youth? Saul apparently does not recognize David. Here's what you need to understand is, David has been coming to the palace to play music since he's probably been as young as 12 years old, and he's now 17 or 18, and he has gone back and forth from Bethlehem, where his family lives, and the palace occasionally to play. Saul is so important, he doesn't really know who this young man is. You change a lot from 12 to 17, and so he asked Abner, what family is this guy from? Verse 17, chapter 17, verse 58. When David is brought in, here's what he says. I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. David is the son of a servant. He comes in as the champion. He's the one who defeated Goliath. He's the one who, when talking to the other soldiers at the encampment, says, what will happen to the guy who beats this champion? And they said, the, the king will just shower him with, with authority, with, with prizes, with presents, with treasure. He will be the toast of Jerusalem. And the first words out of Joseph, uh, David's mouth before king is, I'm the servant, I'm the son of your servant. I'm the son of your servant. 
Now, is that just a polite response? Or does David see himself as a servant? Remember, he's the eighth son. He's the youngest of a large family. Matthew chapter 12, verse 18 Here's how Jesus talks about servanthood. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. This is a reference to Jesus himself. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. When Jesus later gives instructions about being a servant, it is because he is a servant himself. He views himself as the servant of God the Father. Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Yet it shall not be among you. As the disciples argue about who will be the greatest, who will have the most authority, who will be the leader of the pack, he says, it will not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. David obviously doesn't have the ability or the opportunity to know these verses. He doesn't know that an ancestor of him, who will be the king of kings, is going to say that the key to success is servanthood. But David is in a place to be a servant. 1 Samuel 18, verse 2. So Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. So from this day forward, David will be a servant of Saul. He will never return to his family. He won't go back to take care of the sheep. He won't go back to help his father out in the, in the family business. He will remain in Jerusalem, in the palace, serving the king. Samuel warned that to the nation, did he not, when they asked for a king? You're going to ask for a king, and what's he going to do? He's going to take your sons and your daughters. He's going to conscript them for his army. They're going to serve in his palace. They're going to be his perfumers and his cooks. David is going to be his musician and so much more. David will now become Saul's servant. Verse 5. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and behaved wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As David goes out now, he does whatever he's asked of him. How many of you have ever had an employee who just does whatever you ask of them? Or you've worked in a place where one of the employees just, whatever the manager asks, they just do that. Maybe you've worked in a place where people don't want to do what they're told to do. Where they have better ideas of how the operation should work. I've worked in places where people thought they understood the business better than the man who built the business. And you're going, you know, he built the business, you might... I was in an interview one time that was terrible. It was, a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a red flag interview. I'm interviewing in a church to become an associate pastor. The church already had two pastors on staff, senior pastor and a youth pastor. The youth pastor was, I was, oh man, I was, I would have been in my early 30s, maybe 31, 32. And uh, the youth pastor was 40. He'd grown up in the church, got saved as an adult, went off to Bible college, got his degree, and they brought him back, and he became their youth pastor. He actually had teenagers in the youth group because he was 40 years of age. I'm sitting in this, in this church office with the senior pastor, and he's asking me about my experience and the things I've studied and all of this, and, and just asking me random questions about ministry. And I'm telling him, he says, hold on, hold on, hold on. He rushes out of the office and goes down the hall and grabs the youth pastor and brings him into the office. He says, now you tell him what you just told me because he needs to be doing this. I'm 32, not been a pastor anywhere. This guy was grown in this church, saved as an adult, and has been pastoring there for seven years. And this senior pastor wants me to tell him right now what he needs to be doing right. I, I, I didn't, really. I knew that was bad. We didn't go to that church. The day after they were going to vote for me to be their next pastor, half the deacon board resigned, and the church kind of folded. There, there were problems there. You get put in a position where you arrogantly are telling someone else what to do. Here is David who behaves wisely. He's smart enough to know, do what you're told, behave wisely, such that he does not get viewed by the rest of the people or the household of servants as if he's something particularly special. It's important when he says he was accepted in the sight of the people because he was serving the nation as a whole and the other servants, he wasn't being, 
Well, there's this David. He was handpicked by Saul. He now thinks he's better than us. We've been serving here for 10 years. He's in for the first week, and he thinks he's the cream of the crop. I don't think so. Every once in a while, Vicki asks me, or I try and recall, what I did in Anchorage, Alaska, Grace Baptist Church, the first year I was there. And I frankly cannot remember what I did the first year I was there. Because as I walked into that ministry, there are already people in place in all of these ministries, and I'm coming in kind of as a as an associate. Am I gonna over what am I over gonna see? We had a worship leader, we had youth leaders. We had a WANA program that was running on its own and doing great. And I think I started to teach a Sunday school class, and then Pastor Shock said, I'm gonna go away over Christmas and fill in for a missionary and you can preach. Because I think in that first year, you just had to kind of figure out where you fit. And over time, you kind of figure this out. I think that's what David is doing here. So David serves Saul. He follows Saul's command. He earns some responsibility, and he earns respect. 1 Samuel 18, verses 6 and 7. Now it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the woman had come out of the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing, dancing to meet King Saul. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul is slain as thousands and David is ten thousands. <laughs> is there anything ever worse than when a person who is in an inferior position gets greater praise than the supervisor? Is there any more dangerous situation in a work setting? than that a worker gets more praise than the manager who managed the department and the jealousy that enrages. Here's the king. And a servant boy is being recognized as more successful. Now, what might success for a servant bring? So you become successful as a servant. You follow the plan of God. You try and behave wisely. You serve to the best of your ability. What might happen if you become successful? What benefits might you gain? What new opportunities might arise? What rewards might be offered? If you've ever found yourself in that position, in a position at work or in an organization where you're working hard and they begin to give you more responsibilities and more responsibilities, what can happen within the greater picture as you begin to become more successful? 1 Samuel 18, verses 8 and 9. Then Saul was very angry, and the saying displeased him. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. David earns an enemy. You might say that. That happens here with Saul and David, but that doesn't happen in real life. That's probably never happened to any of you. It's happened to me. Where as much as you try and serve, and sometimes you don't serve in the right motivation, but you gain success that someone else above you goes, you're challenging my opportunity. Saul even gets to the point where he says, it's going to be his kingdom. David earns an enemy. Saul's jealous. He's angry. He sees David as a threat. He sees his worth only in a comparative way. Do we have to succeed in life? I mean, are we driven by that? Some recognition that we are successful? Do you need to be better than others? You know what? There's probably none of us who don't want to be better than somebody in something. We just were driven by that. Our culture is driven by that. And we personally are often driven by that. I'm just going to be, I'm going to be better. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a better worker at him. I'm going to be a better, I'm going to be a better parent than my parents were parents. I'm going to be a better brother. I'm going to be a better, and we just work in a comparative way. Saul was visited by a distressing spirit from God. David played music as at other times to soothe Saul, and Saul had a spear in his hand. I can't imagine what would happen. Chapter 18, verse 11. And Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. But David escaped him. What's the last word? Twice. Now, sometimes the Bible gives you the whole story, and there's like a lot of verses. Sometimes it just says ditto, or twice. It happened twice. 
Now, okay, apparently David's not allowed to leave being a servant. But are you seriously going to go into a deranged man's room when he's in his psychotic state and play music with the hope of soothing him when the last time he threw a spear at you? Wouldn't you try and find another servant who could go with you or maybe wear a little armor while you're playing the harp? Twice. Success can breed contempt from others. So how do you handle the rival? How do you handle the opponent? So Saul removed David from his presence as you read through the whole text. And made him a captain over a thousand soldiers. 1 Samuel 18, 14. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. How do we respond to jealousy, to anger, to threat? David follows the wisdom of God. What can I do? You can only do what's right. You can only do what's in front of you. You can only continue to serve. And David here expands his service to more of Israel. No longer is he just within the palace serving Saul directly. Now he is sent out to serve across the nation. Will we serve more and not less? When Saul seeks to kill David through the demand of a dowry. So Saul comes up with an idea. I think I can marry David off to one of my kids. And that will create a bond where he will be more subservient to me. Well, the first wife doesn't work out. She doesn't love David. And Saul gives the first daughter to another man. But the second daughter is Michael. And Michael likes David. And David appreciates Michael. And they love each other. And Saul says... I can get them to marry and get rid of David at the same time. He says, David, you're a poor man. You can't afford to marry the daughter of a king. I'll tell you what you should do. Go out and kill 100 Philistines and bring to me their foreskins as proof that you killed them. Now, David doesn't have to do this as a single soldier. He has men who work for him. He's a commander of a battalion of men, and and he goes out and says, I want to marry your daughter. I'll go out and I'll fight the Philistines and I'll kill 100 of them. Well, David kills 200 of them. 1 Samuel 18, 26 to 27. It pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Therefore, David arose and went, he and his men, and killed 200 Philistines. David accepts this opportunity to become the son-in-law of the king. Now, you might be reading this and going, this, this, is, this, is, this, this can't be true. I mean, this has got to be a fictional story. Nobody would actually live this way. I mean, this is what they would write. Remember the old days when they had, like, the, uh, the Friday night movies, the made-for-TV movies that they used to show, or the weekend movies, and you'd watch them, and they're always kind of chaltzy. I mean, kind of silly stories. I mean, they're putting those movies, the movie of the week, they're putting them together really quickly. They're not spending $150 million to make a movie. They're spending like $35,000 or 36 cents, and they're making a movie. And they're putting together a few things, and they tell this, this little story, and it's kind of silly, and it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Vicki and I watched a movie the other day with Tom Selleck, and I thought, Tom Selleck, he's kind of a funny character. Apparently, he made this whole series of movies, and we're watching this, and we watched it last night, this movie, and we're going, yeah, okay, it was kind of like predictable, it was kind of like, yeah, but it, it wasn't filled with a lot of sex, there wasn't a lot of swearing, and it wasn't a lot of violence, it was like, wow, because it was made a long time ago, and he still had the cheesy mustache. So you read this narrative of David and Saul, and you go, it's like a cheesy movie. It's, you know, I mean, seriously, he throws a spear at you once, you go back in the room, I mean, seriously, you only do that for dramatic effect. He goes back, he tried to kill me twice. He wants me to marry his daughter, this can't go bad. I, oh, he's finally forgiven me. You ever see the show, the story where you think the person's actually forgiven you? There was that whole show called Revenge. Had nothing to do with forgiveness. Read the, watch The Chosen, you'll see forgiveness. And here he goes out and says, I can win over the king. You know what? He wants a hundred. He never once thinks he wants me dead. I'll kill two hundred. So David joins the family of an unstable king, a jealous rival, a sworn enemy. I found early on in my ministry 
that I could never decide for myself what God wanted me to do. I had to leave it for others. And so Vicki and I always set up a standard by which we could allow others to kind of direct our path by their decisions. And we got in an opportunity, we got in a position once where it was an opportunity to take a new ministry and uh, a ministry I dreamed about for years and years and years. And the opportunity was there. The offer had been made, the opportunity to go. And in fact, the other ministry I was in was in really rocky times. And, and it, it felt, like, felt like, like, like the leader didn't want me there. And, and I know that because he said, I don't want you here. Uh, he said it on a phone call and then sent me a fax. That was back in the days of faxes. I, I don't want you here anymore. Take the other job. And I told Vicki about it and I says, I don't know if I'm supposed to take the other job or not. Let's poll the deacons of the church. And if the deacons are unanimous, we'll call that God's will. If they're not unanimous, then we'll probably leave. You know, if like some want us to stay and some want us to go or we'll do that. The deacons met and said, unanimously, we want you to stay. There's still work here we need you to do. And I went to Vicki and I says, they want me to stay unanimously, the ones who selected me to be part of the church, the church itself. I says, I guess I can't take the other opportunity. Here is David. Staying in a situation that is less than ideal. Because he's been offered the opportunity to serve. Verse 29 of chapter 18, and Saul was still more afraid of David, so Saul became David's enemy continually. I don't know how many of you have ever lived in a situation or worked in a situation or found yourself in a situation where you are not the most liked person, where it's, it's stressful to be there, where it's difficult, where it's a challenge. The question doesn't become, is the circumstances challenging? The question becomes is, are you able to serve God in the way God intends you to serve? Do you have the freedom to serve? Apparently, David still has the freedom to serve, even in an unstable kingdom, in the palace of an unstable king, who has a distressing spirit that God puts upon him. Chapter 19, verse 1. Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Saul is not content to throw a spear at David. Twice it hasn't worked. He's got to get some people to help him. He talks to his son Jonathan, who would see David as a rival, because Jonathan should become the next king, right? As the son of the king. And says, I think you need to kill him. Now David receives a death sentence. The king is now his enemy. The resources of the king are able to kill him. And the king seems to be rather determined. Jonathan intervenes. So we can't read all of these passages. You need to spend some time and read through chapter 18 and 19 and see what David does. But David, inter Jonathan intervenes, goes to his father, and convinces Saul to back down. Chapter 19, verse 8. There was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow. Even as... Saul has intimated through words that he wants to kill this man. David goes back out to war and fights for Saul and wins for Saul and plays music for Saul when the distressing spirit from God comes upon him again. How do we know that? Verse 10, chapter 19, then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, so David fled and escaped that night. David flees from Saul. He flees to Samuel, and Saul sends servants to get him. At what point at what point does God step in to help us with a challenging circumstance? or being connected to people who don't like us. Can God work out the circumstances to free you to continue to serve him even if the fleeing creates greater hardship? 
So when Seven Deacon says, we want you to stay, and I stayed for four more years, and those seven deacons voted five weeks after our senior pastor resigned and voted for me to leave and not stay, God enabled my house to sell in one day. In one day, my house sold. Now, I couldn't move for two more months because it took that long to close, and in those two months, I had the opportunity to preach two months worth of a series of messages for that church to continue on after they'd fired me and the senior pastor had resigned. And the freedom to serve was there for eight weeks. And two years in cuts down the freedom to serve. And here, 20 years, the freedom to serve that you give me. I hope you feel you have the freedom to serve in this community. There are opportunities that arise. I got a contact from the elementary school last week about backpacks. I'd ask them at the end of the school year, I substitute over there, and I ask the, the office at the end of the school year, can you tell me exactly what you need so we can tailor our ministry to help you exactly? So they got back to me, they called me, and they said, we don't need backpacks. We still have backpacks, the ones you generously gave last year. We still have enough we think we'll cover this year. He says, what we're finding is in the elementary school. What we're finding is that the parents are so excited about their kids going to school, even if they don't have the money, they somehow figure out how to get a backpack and buy school supplies. Here's what we need. We need underwear. We need shoes. We need snacks. Because kids who get free breakfast and free lunch do not have snacks to bring. And we need snacks. And I says, send me a list. So I contacted the middle school and says, are they in the same boat? Contacted the middle school. And uh, uh, the, the one I contacted, he got back to me and says, I'm going in this morning. We're talking about that very thing. I'll get back to you in two hours. He got back and says, we need backpacks. We definitely need them in the middle school. We use them all. And, 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 and then he said this, can you get a little better quality backpack? Because they tend to tear. So the ones I ordered are being sent back. I ordered the new ones. And having been over there now in those schools as a substitute, I noticed that the things we had done, like for earbuds and stuff like that, don't really work, and they need headphones, and I found headphones. Will God sometimes direct our steps in ministry more specifically? He can. The needs are there. The opportunities are there. Sometimes the opposition will come in the form of this David-Saul narrative. What we're going to see next week, if I can preview it for you. God's going to step into the life of Saul and into the life of David and show them that he is in control and nothing will harm his plan. If God wants us to accomplish something, if we will be humbly faithful to him, he will accomplish it, and we'll see him do that work. Now, we can pursue a lot of stuff on our own and give ourselves the praise for what we've accomplished. We probably do that on a regular basis. And, and we'll brag about what we just got done and some project we just finished and, you know, all of that. But if we'll follow God and allow him to direct our steps, then he can get the glory for what is accomplished as he opens the doors and closes the doors of opportunity. There's a group of cyclists who are going to be in our parking lot this Saturday. This will be the third or fourth year. They run this state championship right here in Trumansburg, this bicycle racing thing. And every year they contact me and say, can we use your parking lot? We'll set up our big wagon. We'll bring in a porta potty and all of that. I said, absolutely. And he just contacted me again. He says, are we still all set? Absolutely. You need a power cord? I'll bring one out. I'll be there Saturday morning to help you. Just a way of saying to people in our community, 
God gave us this huge resource, and it's not being used on a Saturday morning. Come use the parking lot. There's been a neighbor who parks in our parking lot here during the week, right in a prime spot. And somebody said to me the other day, well, who's parking there? Shouldn't we put a note on there and tell them not to park there? I says, they moved the car before our services. What, what are, there's 60 spots out there. They're not parking in any place particular that bothers me. I don't know. God has a way of protecting us from those who are jealous of the work God does. But we must continue to serve. David is an illustration of a man after God's own heart who serves when it's inconvenient, who serves when it's dangerous, who serves when it doesn't necessarily move him forward in life. Unlike Joseph, who apparently over a period of years rises to the top of Egypt. David's going to have a longer road, a more difficult path. And it's hard for me to summarize his life in a message or two that doesn't get to the heart of what God does in him. We probably should pause and spend 50 weeks in some of the Psalms to read the heart of David because that's where you find it. As he struggles with his own sin, he struggles with his own discouragement, he struggles with injustice, but he always ends each psalm with, God, you're God, and I will serve you. We do communion once a month. We'll conclude the service again today with that. And there's a setup in the back, and there's a setup in the front. And if you haven't been here for this, the people who are in the back half of the auditorium go out the side aisles and come into the center. The people in the front half of the auditorium just come down the center and circle around the sides. We take the communion as a reminder of a relationship we say we have embraced with Jesus Christ. The forgiveness he offered on the cross, we have accepted that truth and have placed our faith in the fact that God saves us and we don't save ourselves. I've read a lot of reviews from camp counselors of our kids who've gone to camp. They send them to me. I get a copy of every evaluation of every one of our kids who goes to camp. And they send them to me. And I read the, the words that the counselor has for where they think the camper started at the beginning of the week where they think they ended. And it's a very simple scale that Greg has developed for the counselors. They're not trying to nuance seven and eight-year-olds or 13 and 14-year-olds. But what the counselors are trying to share at the end of those evaluations is they share, if I had to do it again with this child, would I do some things differently? Would I spend some different time? Would I approach some different subjects? And it's always fascinating to read. And here's an interesting thing that happens. If a child returns to camp for a second week, they often put the child back with the same counselor. Now, you might say, if the kid was a problem kid, you might want to spread that joy around. But what it really does is a counselor who's had maybe a struggle with a child for a week gets a second chance to work in the life of that child. Julia was telling me about that. She had a tough first junior week. Out of like seven kids, five were tough. <laughs> five tough kids, and she had a hard time. She saw her list for the second week, and one of those kids was back. And Vicki was saying, you got a second chance. You got another opportunity. You know this kid. And Julia said, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm going to take things a little differently. That's what God does in our lives, does he not? He takes us a little differently. At camp, they are trying to lead children on a journey to embrace Christ. There's going to be decisions made along the way. There's going to be prayers that are, that are offered up from campers. There's going to be counselors giving them the words of the gospel so they can learn the words of the gospel. But the proof will come often in the life of the staffers who started as campers, who now want to serve, sometimes for free, sometimes for little money, and the adults who come to a place like Omoka and say, I'm going to spend my own money to serve. 
That's the proof of the change of the gospel in lives. Just one illustration. So as we come to take the communion, I ask you to come if you're embracing what Christ has done. The truth that he died on the cross and paid for your sins. I'm not asking where you are in your journey. All of us are at different points, at different places, but now you're saying once again, Jesus is the focus of my life. He is the reason I even give my attention to the Bible. And so I'll take that cup that represents his body and his blood once again to remind myself what it's all about. Dear Father, We ask, Lord, that you would help us in our moments of weakness when we become jealous of others or envious or when we become discouraged by opposition that we feel is around us. Help us, Lord, just to see the opportunity to serve in front of us each day. Help us not become so wrapped up in our own agenda, our own ideas, our own pursuits that we miss the chance to simply touch another life when it's inconvenient or when we're tired or when we want someone to serve us. Help us not to be so arrogant about our own importance and understand that only you are important, that only you rise to the top, that only you are worthy of all service, and yet you came as a servant to all of us. Lord, as we think of the communion and take the cup and, and, and drink the juice that represents your blood and eat the, the cracker that represents your body that we are connecting to you in a in a truly real and personal way that you might truly be honored by our commitment of faith once again demonstrated this way. We pray in Christ's name, amen. You can rise and begin to go to the tables. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. The sun comes.
symbols are simple. There's the cup that has the bread in it. Without the body, there would be no life as we understand it. Jesus didn't come as a spirit. He didn't come in and out and float into people's lives. He didn't appear to them in dreams. He came with a body. He ate with them. He walked with them. He lied down. He slept. He got weary. He embraced people. He touched them. That is his body. And this is what he gave. Let's take it. But even today, we understand that there's no life in the body without the blood. There's nothing that carries the oxygen that operates all of the functions, the brain, the muscles, the hands, the feet. There's nothing you can do. You can't speak. Not without the oxygen that is carried by the blood. Without the blood, there is no life. And so Jesus came in a real fashion. But we need to understand that his life operated in the same ways that ours did. That once the blood was spilled, the body ceased to function. No longer would he walk and talk among us. Not without some dramatic change. A permanent dramatic change. Unlike others who were raised from the dead, either by the hands of Elisha or Elijah or the hands of Jesus himself, those people would once again fall prey to death. But when Jesus shed his blood, it was once for all. It was for all men. It was a symbol that he could take the death penalty for every human who would ever live. And then once that penalty was paid, it could not and would not be paid again. That men would live eternally. The question is, where will you live in eternity? You're either going to live with God in his presence or apart from God, out of his presence. You're still going to live. Eternity has been purchased. All men will live forever. The question is the destination. So when Jesus shed that blood, he says, I'm going to end this life as you know it and offer you an eternal existence in my presence if you'll embrace the sacrifice I made. You could die for your own sins, but then you are dead. Never to be resurrected. But if I die for your sins, I can give my life and I can take it back. Since I created the blood in the body, I can do with it what I please. I can suffer the indignity of the judgment of your sin, but I can rise from that, remaining purified and holy and offer that to you. So we drink the blood recognizing that the change that has been made is one in which we now have eternal life and get an opportunity to choose the destination of that eternal life in the presence of the one who bought it or apart from him for all eternity. Let's drink. As you can see from the words that are on the screen, what Jesus asked of his disciples was that they would follow him. They would walk with him, and they would pursue his agenda. When Jesus got ready to leave, he said, I want you to go into the world and make disciples. That is the following that has never changed. And how will you do that? Because you will love me and you will love them. And you will pursue the truth and share the truth. Let me invite you to stand as we sing this song. 
I hope it is the cry of your heart to follow him. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me your holy ways, O Lord, that I might walk in your truth. Teach me your holy ways, O Lord, and make me holy devoted to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to Jason, would you close in prayer, please? Dear Lord, thank you for the time we have this morning. And I just don't ask for your word. Just like David. Just pray that we would go forth here today fully devoted to you. Now, that that would be the cry of our hearts. We would serve you and all of this. Servants.